welcome to The Wellness Way with me, Philly J. Lay, a lay person's guide to your natural health systems, your very own NHS. Hello, lovely people, and welcome to another episode of The Wellness Way. I can't tell you how excited and how nervous I am to interview my guest today. He's a man whose work over the last 10 years has been so crucial to my recovery. I remember listening to a lecture he did talking about breathing in your gut biome and putting your toothbrush on either side of the basin every day so that you're getting different biome. And I kind of thought, what on earth is this about? Um, <laughs> and so I started studying his work and it has been a complete an utter revelation and joy to me. So today, without further ado, I'm going to bring on Zach Bush, MD. He's a renowned multidisciplined physician of internal medicine. He is, oh, I mean, you're an expert in just about everything, Zach, <laughs> from the gut biome to the soil to regenerative farming. Uh, and I've been blessed enough to see you lecture twice this year in 2023, uh, once with the Farmer's Footprint, which was just the most extraordinary evening. Zach, welcome on the show. Wonderful to be with you, Philly, and all of you in the audience. So glad to be with each of you. It's a blessing to be having a human moment together. Oh, thank you for coming on. First of all, I want you to tell the audience, because you trained as a doctor, you know, a, a normal doctor, you were working in a hospital, <laughs> um, and something happened in your path that kind of threw you in another direction. So can you tell us about your training and what made you change your mind about the system you were trained in? Sure, yeah, my background is in internal medicine um, after going through kind of your normal allopathic Western medical doctor training medical school out in Colorado. And then my uh, all my postdoctoral work was at the University of Virginia for 10 years there. And I did a, a couple of subspecialties there and then a third one when I left the university. Uh, my first especially was in internal medicine, which was really focused on hospital care, as you mentioned there. So a lot of ICU management, all that. I did run my own primary care outside in a clinical setting as well um, as an outpatient clinic at the same time. But 80% of my work was in, in the hospital during those years and then went on to faculty teaching year as a chief resident for internal medicine and then uh, went uh, from there into a subspecialty of endocrinology and metabolism, which is studying the way in which the 70 trillion human cells coordinate uh, a biologic phenomenon of one body. You know, how, do, how do all your different organ systems understand one another and co-create you know, a vital life, which depends on constant uh, interaction, constant communication between the systems to function in a healthy fashion. So I was fascinated by that kind of root of a system that's that created the symphony of health because I had gotten pretty disillusioned and exhausted of the kind of disease management model that I was doing in internal medicine, recognizing that uh, very few people in a hospital system are empowered or educated to be looking at the bigger picture of the body. And uh, for the vast majority of the system, we're trained into these categorical subspecialties that are organ specific and so you've got your kidney doctor you've got your lung doctor you got your heart doctor you got your brain doctor and so when you got all these you know sub sub specialties nobody's seen the forest for the trees and you know in hindsight you know i can recognize now that one of my passions in life and maybe you know on an ideal day one of my superpowers is systems thinking like how, how do complex systems coordinate themselves and how do we find root cause problems and therefore root cause solutions uh, within those complex systems once they dysregulate. Sorry to interrupt this podcast. Why don't you come and sign up to my newsletter at phillyjlay.com where we can keep connected and we can talk about lots of things going on in the world. You will also get my free manifestation meditation so you can become a shit hot manifester too. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share and turn your notifications on so you never miss an episode. Thank you. And my joy has been you know, seeing that intersection moved from endocrinology where I was doing cancer research into the microbiome, which was a burgeoning field in the late 2000s. So 2005, 2010, my chemotherapy research was in this, in the environment of, of nutrients. And so I was finding vitamin A compounds that could kill cancer 
which got me to nutrition. Nutrition was that slippery slope as the debut of the microbiome was really happening in that portion of the decade. Uh, we were starting to do the first genetic sequencing of the microbiome in the gut and finding out that we could predict which cancers people got by which bacteria were in their gut. And this was just quackery for our established you know, agreement of what cancer is and how it happens. The microbiome did not fit any of those classical models. And so there was a deep challenge happening to the rhetoric or dogma around our concepts of cancer. And that got super intriguing for me very quickly. And so left the university in 2010 after trying to start a nutrition center within the university setting, realized I was going to have to do that outside of it. And so started a nutrition center for reversing chronic disease through our food systems uh, in 2010. And then that spawned a whole bunch of other companies and nonprofits and everything else working at that intersection between human health, planetary health, with a focus on that intersection at, at soil and food systems. And it's quite revolutionary within the medical system to talk about food and diet and, you know, the, the whole body being connected. <laughs> Who'd have thought that one, eh? How, how did this go down when you started trying to, you were looking at this, talk us through cancer and what you discovered with your patients with cancer, because I find that quite extraordinary. Yeah, what we were finding in my basic science laboratory and ended up, you know, being able to fast track, you know, drug concept to clinical trial very quickly. Usually that's kind of a 10 to 15 year process. And within a two year process, I was able to get my first clinical trial underway. And what I was finding at the basic science level was that cancer cells are very poorly equipped to deal with the explosion of energy that happens when good nutrients get inside of a cell. And so the realization that cancer cells are a population of cells within your body that have a diminished capacity for energy production and a decreased capacity to integrate energy once it's released. And so the idea that maybe we could feed cancers to death rather than poison them through chemotherapy was the breakthrough there. I would leave the university in 2010 and then a couple of years later in 2012, you know, as we started researching soil systems, because we were finding that the food we were using wasn't working as it was supposed to. I was basing a lot of my clinical protocols on science that had come out of the 1970s with Colin Campbell, who had done a lot of the research in the 1960s and 70s with, uh, he was out of Cornell, but he was part of these large government uh, nutrition studies that were done at the population public health level in the Philippines. So after World War II, we moved into the Philippines to try to do humanitarian relief for a lot of these children that were starving at the time, put them on high protein diets to find out 11 years later in the follow-up that we had caused a bunch of liver cancer in these children. And initially the theory was maybe they got poisoned by, you know, munitions from World War II or something like this. But long story short, by the 1960s, Colin Pella had, I'm sorry, Colin Campbell had, um, you know, demonstrated that uh, it was really the, the protein overload that was causing liver stress and liver cancer and liver inflammation. And so all of that was pointing us towards the importance of, fuel as a source for energy to prevent and, and treat cancer, uh, which is glucose and fatty acids. And if you go to any institution, they'll tell you that sugar causes cancer, um, you know, carbohydrates cause cancer. And, and the reality of that is much more nuanced than, than that simple algorithm. And it turns out it's really simplified, purified, um, you know, carbohydrate molecules that are processed into non-natural substances, such as high fructose corn syrup. They can really drive the inflammation that we would, you know, put at the base of, of the cancer process. And so starting to realize that, you know, apple does fructose perfectly and it has a, the perfect fiber as the antidote to that sugar, such that that sugar is not cancer causing. What do we do as humans to screw up that carbohydrate structure to, to create an inflammatory structure? So that's, that was a lot of the aha moments of like, wow, we've really screwed with our food system and as we started to tease out that nutritional thing, we started to realize there's something even deeper that hasn't been described as to like why kale isn't working like it used to, why tomatoes don't have the same anti-cancer effect they did in the 1960s. So that's where we started, you know, uh, diving in a little bit into the, the soil stuff to try to figure out, you know, is something fundamentally changed in the soil that leading to this de detri detriment of nutrition and nutrient com complex or nutrient medicine within our foods. Uh, over that period of time. And of course, we found that not only were the nutrients lacking, our food was now carrying toxins and those toxins are herbicides and pesticides. 
So we developed a biotech company, uh, Biomic Sciences, that really became the first to really start to demonstrate the direct human impact of herbicides and pesticides in our food and water systems with a specific focus on glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, which is the most abundant you know, chemical on the earth now. Uh, the glyphosate molecules at about 4 billion pounds a year being poured into soils worldwide, about two and a half ki uh, billion kilograms. And so you, when you try to wrap your head around what a billion kilograms of a toxin looks like, it just kind of boggles the human, human capacity there. So, so this is a toxin that's become normalized into our daily human experience. It's in our water, it's in our rainfall, it's in our air we breathe. And so we're just saturated with this chemical. And it was that study of that, the impact of that chemical, which functions as an antibiotic on that deep, you know, reservoir of life within our soil systems, within our gut systems, within the body systems. And so that was kind of the slippery slope into, you know, the discovery that soil management is really the death nail of humanity as a species and our potential future, you know, pathway forward as we started to realize that the microbiome really does sit at the root of all human health and therefore you know, dysfunction and human disease. And so not only uncovering the problem, but as soon as you find a problem or a wound, you've also found the antidote. And that's kind of was our discovery on the microbiome in 2010 to 12. This microbiome was still not a buzz term yet at this point. It was in its infancy. Nobody had heard of the microbiome, which is why I was so shocked when, when I heard your first lecture. I'm just like, what is this? This is just extraordinary. Um, we've had a very sad week in Europe this week. We're recording this in November 2023, and the European Parliament have just granted another 10-year license on glyphosate. They have... Um, allowed or you know tweaked a couple of things like uh, decantation what you know when farmers spray the wheat just before they harvest to kill it so they can get a bigger crop but you know it's here to stay another 10 years and as you say it's absolutely everywhere in the air we breathe you know in our soil in our water and I just want to that sounds really depressing and I you're a man that has always filled me with hope and so I want you to to talk to the audience about how extraordinary the body is now the body is made up of of water but it's a special kind of water you know it's not the the water you know and I've, I've just done a, a podcast on filtering water because we do want to get the glyphosate out we do want to get all the um, drugs out that other people People have taken but the, talk to us about the special form of water that we're made up from and how we have this innate ability to heal ourselves and so we don't have to live in fear do we Zach no the body is really a healing machine and a deeper truth in that is nature is a healing machine and so the the realization that we can't actually you know, be birthed, let alone maintain health and longevity as a human being without our connection to, you know, nature, without our connection to this deep micro and macrobiome system around us uh, has been a revelation that's really, I think, going to reshape, you know, the, the future of medicine as well as the future of human health as we start to rewrite ourselves back into nature. The wound that we're talking about here, this kind of belief that we're against nature is perhaps one of the oldest, you know, phenomenon or, you know, uh, if we can even use the word mistake, but it, it's it's one of the earliest things that we can pinpoint as to how humans became the extractive, destructive, you know, species that we've become on the planet. And it's this belief that we somehow are outside of nature we got rejected by nature it's in our religious myths you know being kicked out of the garden and all this and in that the very first symptom of being kicked out of the garden you'll remember in our our myth stories uh, and uh, as well as our kind of religious texts that we look at we can find that the first symptom of separation from nature was shame and so we developed this shame guilt and then ultimately fear of nature as we had the conscious capacity through our five senses to start to believe that we were separate from. And some of our more recent, you know, spiritual texts, things like the Course of Miracles and stuff have even described that the five senses of humans were designed intentionally for our belief that we were separate from nature. And that's been a long process for me to kind of ask that deeper question then of like, well, what is the silver lining? Because if, if every wound has an antidote, what's the antidote to believing we are separate? 
And the, the antidote really comes in our capacity to see beauty because we have the perception and therefore the, the experience of that separateness from a sunset or a mountain range or the forest, we actually have the unique capacity to witness beauty in a unique way. And you maybe have sat and watched many sunsets or sunrises in your lifetime. And it's notable that no other species is lining up staring at the sunset. <laughs> You're really the only one there that's witnessing this thing and just dumbfounding with so much that we stop our behavior, previous behavior to watch this and we'll forgo dinner we'll for, forgo anything else for that capacity and opportunity to see beauty and so it seems to be really this wonderful trait within humanity and i think probably our deepest purpose as to why are we in the cosmos right now it is to see beauty because when we witness beauty we actually you know that water tower that you're talking about starts to to vibrate in the frequency that we have you know come to call the word love but i think that word is you know has a lot of reductionist belief systems and baggage around it and it's it's really a poor word but the frequency that occurs when you ex see beauty is probably our greatest gift that we can contribute to the universe this vibration the water structure that you talked about is critical in that mission and purpose of vibration one of the the interesting facts is that your body is 70 percent water and yet when you cut yourself no water comes pouring out of your body and the reason for that is the, the you know millions of cells that you disrupt with a simple laceration or cut those millions of cells don't suddenly dump water out because the water is held in a gel state and this has been popularized as the fourth phase of water uh, I think it could actually be the fifth phase of water, but you know it's just not nomenclature really. All, all it is to say is that it's not liquid. It's not ice, obviously. And so it's, it's this in-between phase, this gel state. And the function of the water molecule in that gel state is very unique in that it's, it's functioning as a liquid crystal. And a liquid crystal that you would find in something like gelatin or jello, you know, that makes your liquid jello go from, from something you pour in the bowl to a couple hours later solid. That's the crystalline structure of that protein giving water, you know, a scaffold to hold on to. Your cells are full of proteins that allow water to organize around them. And some of those more important structures are the nucleotide sequences that we call DNA. So DNA bundled inside of the nucleus of your cells or the protein structures like actin filaments that run throughout the whole matrix of the inside of the cell, outside of the cell, allow water to organize themselves in these liquid crystals. But to get to that liquid crystal state, you need a very high amount of electrical charge across the cell membrane. Cell membrane is has an enormous voltage potential across it, um, even though it's a small millivolt charge. The, the proximity of the positive or negative charge across the tiny little microscopic membrane creates a voltage change that's similar to that of lightning. So a very potent amount of electrical charge held across a healthy cell membrane. That cell membrane then and that electrical charge pulls water across it through a gradient of salt. Basically, there's a high amount of potassium inside the cell that pulls water inside, as does the, the electrical charge inside that membrane. And so the electrical charge and the electrolytes inside the cell pull the water across in a passive process. There's no pumps that pump the water in. And there's just these open channels called aquaporins. And so liquid water goes from your bloodstream into the plasma state and then into the cell across those aquaporins. And as soon as it transits that high electrical charge environment, it, it transforms into this gel state. And so that liquid crystal seems to be able to hold light or electromagnetic frequency, just the same as a liquid crystal does in a radio. Uh, you might remember that the you know, radios of the 1940s and 50s that I actually collected when I was a kid and everything else, even that was a couple of decades later, but I was so fascinated by tube radios and I was a ham radio operator. And so was used to transmitting and receiving information through the, these, these tubes, these big vacuum tubes. And the vacuum tubes had to be at different sizes to, to absorb different frequencies or different wavelengths of radio signal coming in. As we made the advent to the, the liquid crystal or the crystal radios of the 1960s and 70s, that was that advent of a tiny little radio could suddenly be made because you didn't need the big tube as the resonance chamber there. 
And so getting that resonance chamber all the way down to a crystal was allowed us to have these, these incredible uh, frequency transmitters, receivers in very small packages. The cell is the ultimate, you know, radio system. It's the ultimate transceiver. And so it can both transmit and receive frequency resonance due to the amount of liquid crystal that's in there. So your body is is that kind of, you know, mission, I think. You're, you're designed to receive and transmit information uh, out into nature, from nature, out into the cosmos, perhaps. You know, I think with 8 billion of us on the planet, we're probably very visible in somebody's you know electromagnetic frequency detection we're, we are sending out an enormous amount of information through our own technology which is the human heart interfacing with this huge gel you know column of, of transceiver information and then our five senses that allow us to see beauty so that's you know a bit of a bit of the matrix there that we're stepping into understanding oh i love the matrix so when you were doing your research with cancer you noticed that the energy the cell vibration levels were quite radically different with people with cancer can you talk us through the different stages of or the different levels of the cells yeah, I mean, so there's some pretty simple uh, testing methods for looking at the amount of charge across a single cell membrane and therefore the amount of water in that liquid crystal state. Um, it's a simple tool called a, a phase angle device, or, uh, and this this device looks like a bit of like an EKG, I suppose, and that's got those sticky pads that you would put on the across the chest to look at the electrical activity of the heart. Instead of doing that on the heart, you put a couple of a one lead on a, a pointer finger, one on the wrist, and then one on the uh, ankle and one on the toe. And with that, you lay the patient flat, and that col flat column of water has a very predictable um, level of resistance across it, basically. And the higher the resistance across the whole column of water, the more electricity it can hold. And so it's it's the same reason we we coat copper wires in plastic as an insulator is to keep the keep the wire from dissipating electrical energy. Electricity has, has a tendency to dissipate if not held uh, behind a, a membrane such as plastic or a phospholipid membrane of cell that is hydrophobic. And so you want something that doesn't allow water to cross and therefore it doesn't allow electricity to cross. And so that insulator of, of the wire is you know mimicking every single cell with a nice you know coating of plastic basically around it, form of uh, fatty acids or lipids, and so this uh, measurement uh, at an ideal level of health has a phase angle of typically around ten. I've seen it as high as thirteen, but that's super eight and typical. But kind of eight to ten is your typical super healthy young individual. By the time you get cancer, you're typically at a phase angle of four down from 10 and death happens at 3.5. And so the realization that cancer is this end stage symptom rather than a disease of that dropping electromagnetic you know, energy field of the body. And so as we lose electrical potential, as we lose our ability to store that, uh, that light energy within each cell, we start to accumulate injury. We're no longer repairing and regenerating at, at, at the right pace. And so we slide into disrepair and ultimately deterioration to the point of physiologic death. And so we got really passionate about realizing like, rather than focusing on the tumor, why aren't we just focusing on raising people's energetic levels? If you can take somebody from a four to a six, aren't you gonna prevent and probably eliminate cancer in their body at that point? So that became our passion was, how do you do that? And nutrition was an obvious piece of that because the food you consume is the way in which you interact with sunlight most directly. Um, sunshine is stored within your food by chlorophyll, which are in the plants, the green plants. The green plant is full of a little tiny mitochondria, which we call plant plastid. It functions, it, it has the mirror image function of a mitochondria that lives inside of an animal. So multicellular animals have mitochondria, multicellular plants have plastids. Both are bacteria um, that are subspecialized. And so the, the plant plastid before animal life started to be able to capture CO2 out of the atmosphere and then store sunlight in a double carbon bond. So the electromagnetic energy from the sun entering the, the chlorophyll bacterium is stored between those carbons. And it turns out that that double carbon bond is the best battery that's ever been devised in nature or physics 
and it stores an amazing amount of light energy. As the chlorophyll start to build a chain of those CO2 into a long chain of double carbon bonds, you end up with a fatty acid or a glucose fat or a sugar based on you know, the, the amount of oxygen and hydrogen that are you know, around the carbon. It'll become either carbohydrate or fat, but both carbs and fat are just long carbon chains that store sunlight. When you consume those foods, they will go ultimately deliver the, the carbohydrate and fats into your bloodstream. Those end up absorbed into a human cell and still useless. The human cell can't use them. So they have to pass this on to the mitochondria living inside of them. And there's a whole garden of, of mitochondria. There's a healthy soil system in your gut, but there's also a healthy soil system inside every single one of your 70 trillion cells. And it dwarfs the microbiome of your gut. So your gut and your skin and like all the surfaces that have microbiome on it are thought to contain somewhere around one and a half trillion organ. I'm sorry, one and a half quadrillion organisms. So 70 trillion cells are outnumbered 10 to one by it, it and it could be as much as 100 to one but somewhere in that 10 to 1 to 101 bacteria per human cell but those are outside of the human cells so those are maybe in the bloodstream in the gut uh, we now know that there's microbiome in the brain and the, and the cerebral spinal fluid around the prostate breasts like every tissue in the body has microbiome associated with the, the human cells but they're outside the cells inside the cells the mitochondria are again 10x the population of the, the previous microbiome described. And so your, your mitochondrial population is around 14 quadrillion uh, mitochondria per human being. And so the, now you're at this you know, exponential level of you know, life force at the cellular level. Those mitochondria are releasing sunlight from those long carbon chains. It starts breaking the the carbohydrate or the fat back down to CO2 and in so doing releasing sunlight back into the cell, which is of course stored in that liquid crystal that we described initially. And so ultimately physiology or biology is a description of a concentration of light energy at about a hundred, I'm sorry, about a thousand times that of physics. So the brightest thing that physics does is a, is a sun or a star. A sun is, is a nuclear fission fusion event that creates all that light energy from the, the fission and fusion of heavy elements and releasing energy from, you know, actual atoms. And so you're taking atoms and breaking them apart, releasing an electromagnetic field or electromagnetic energy from, from the atoms within that solar event or that giant explosion uh, that we call nuclear fission. So that's the brightest thing that the sun that nature does in the form of physics. Life or biology is a thousand times brighter at the single celled organism level. So bacteria, fungi, they can produce about a thousand times the amount of energy per cubic centimeter as the, the nuclear fission does of the sun. So life was basically, you know, a logarithmic improvement in the production or storage of light energy per cubic centimeter. When we made the revolution as a biology to mitochondria, we 10 x fermentation, which was what bacteria and fungi do to release that light energy. So mitochondria allowed human cells or multicellular life, you know, birds, mammals, whatever, earthworm, these multicellular creatures were able to get 10 x improvement. So now you're at 10,000 times brighter than the sun is a cubic centimeter of a multicellular organism per, you know, per cubic centimeter of that life generating or light generating force the mitochondria there so that's that's an exciting algorithm so if food can deliver light and we know that cancer is a symptom of a diminishment of the light energy per cubic centimeter then suddenly we understand how what you eat is what you become you know the the food you you eat or the food you fail to eat is really going to dictate your health or disease by those patterns it's a signaling mechanism it's that simple it's signaling to your body you know what vibration it's going to go on and there are other things that you can do as well aren't there like getting out into sunshine getting your feet onto the soil doing your grounding uh, and I know one of your absolute favorites because I used to send a photograph of myself to your social media oh every week for about a year of me standing out there breathing in my gut bio when you use are you still publishing those I don't know well, if you are every Friday every Friday we have all right <laughs> Breathe your bio. I can't tell you how many photographs. So I'm going to ask you a favor. I'm going to send you one when we finish this podcast. Let's and you better bloody put it up. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so, so let's talk about the breath, because um, that is also an energy signaling mechanism. And we don't be properly anymore in this day and age. We breathe too shallow, too fast. You know, we're not connected. We're not present. We're not breathing. And the earth is in trouble. You know, we we all know the earth is in trouble, but um, I don't believe that the scientists are telling us the whole picture here. So will you run us through breath and what's wrong with what's happening with uh, carbon, really? Yeah, so the respiratory cycle of the cell is what occurs inside the mitochondria, as just described. And so without the, the exchange of oxygen and carbon carbon dioxide, there's a belief that humans breathe oxygen and exhale carbon, and trees do the opposite. But it turns out that every, every cell actually has respiration of CO2, and the amount of oxygen present in human or, or mammalian biology accelerates the amount of carbon you cycle. But uh, CO2 is necessary for every cell as a respiratory function to maintain pH and maintain nutrient uh, cycling and all this. And so CO2 is breathed by every cell to the degree that if, you know, if every day we, we're growing human cells in incubators in our laboratory to do experiments on, those incubators are separated away from the, uh, you know, ambient air. So they don't have access to the normal fractions of gas so you close that door and within minutes the, the amount of gases are changing the atmosphere actually has very little co2 in it and you would think with all the demonization of co2 we have and the story of global warming because of co2 and all this that's some sort of like abundant molecule but 0.04 percent of the atmosphere is actually co2 so tiny bit of co2 out there and as soon as you isolate you know uh, an air system that co2 starts to go away and so it's it's a, a realization that we need to you know um, really respirate. We we need to be in the environment of CO two all the time. So we have to pump CO two into the incubators to grow human cells. Uh, without that, they die very quickly. So maintaining CO two respiration within cellular systems, human, tree, or otherwise, is critical. So to to get that oxygen CO two cycling and to start to accelerate the metabolism of mitochondria. Breath work is very important because, like you said, we've fallen out of out of routine of good breathing, and so there's many, many different you know access points. Ancient ones, qigong, tai chi, all these things taught breath work for thousands, of nine thousand years or so, and then yoga came along. Another four thousand years of yoga traditions and pranayama and and um, different forms of you know, kundalini breathing practices, all kinds of stuff. Uh, kundalini being a description of the movement of energy through the human body through breath. And so breath is a is potent, potent tool out there. My favorite ones tend to be out of the Qigong environment, but it's just kind of user preference, really. And if you, the yogic stuff is your, your angle to go that way. But once you start breathing and, and getting these really high intensity respiratory cycles kicked in, the amount of energy that you can put into a human body and the amount of neurochemical release and the amount of, you know, kind of vitality that can come coursing through your body is pretty dumbfounding. It is. I'm a Soma breathwork coach uh, and I love Soma. Uh, and obviously it's based on a lot of different traditions. But my God, I remember when I had COVID and my oxygen levels dropped really, really low. And my kids put that snappy thing on my finger, phoned their dad uh, and he said, call an ambulance. And I just looked at my kids and said, over my dead body, I'm just going to put Soma breathwork on, please, love. I'm going to do some breathwork. And they're going, mom, we've got to call an ambulance. But I did breathwork and I was absolutely fine in 10 minutes and we have these extraordinary abilities that we don't use because we panic that we need the western medical system to support us we don't understand how extraordinary we are and you talk there about the co2s and you know i'd like to go a little bit further on climate change because there is so much fear on climate change when i was a child it, there was a big thing in the 70s of global cooling and then we went into global warming uh, and now we're in climate change because it just seems to be able to put a blanket over everything so that we just go oh it's climate change now i'm not saying we're not killing the planet with all the plastic and all the shit that we do uh, but Talk to us your views. I'd love them on climate change. Yeah, I think what happened in 2006 when Al Gore released the film Inconvenient Truth, um, it basically was a reductionist 
viewpoint, which is another way of saying the masculine, you know, <laughs> uh, viewpoint with the complete divorce of any feminine archetype within it of we are causing global change because of fossil fuel burning and CO2. And so this was the sudden politicalization that's led to this explosion of wind power and solar power and all these other modalities that are called, you know, alternative energy or green energy and these kinds of things. It turns out that, you know, CO2 is not the driving force of any, any negative change on the planet. CO2 is always a symptom of what's going on in the respiratory cycle of the planet. And so this is just like you were describing in, in your COVID situation, but the more you know, apt example is probably emphysema or COPD as a medical condition of a human being is exactly what we've done to the planet. So we've basically induced a planetary emphysema condition. Emphysema is where you expose the lung tissue to a chronic toxin to destroy lung tissue such that there's less and less surface area to exchange the gases across from your bloodstream to the air that you breathe. And so uh, no matter how many times somebody breathes uh, that has advanced emphysema, they can't exchange carbon and oxygen across that membrane. And so they start dying of vitality for a lack of that cycle, a lack of that respiratory uh, movement of gases across the membranes and ultimately into the mitochondria. No matter, it's important for us to recognize that, you know, you can then go measure the CO2 in the bloodstream of somebody with emphysema and watch it climb. And, and we do this every day, like, you know, in the ICUs, we twice a day, we'll, we'll measure blood chemistries and that CO2 level just keeps climbing and climbing and climbing in, in a COPD exacerbation. And no matter if you have them on a respirator or not, there's no amount of oxygen you can force into the body to correct this situation. In fact, the more oxygen you give them, typically the faster they die. And so there's this weird balance where we see low oxygen. We think, oh, it needs more oxygen. When in fact, what it needs is CO2 to move through the cycle so that the oxygen is no longer you know, a problem. Oxygen, again, it accelerates the demands on the CO2 cycling. So if you give oxygen but can't move carbon back and forth across that membrane, you're, you're accelerating death. And so there, there's always this balancing act in the ICU. You, you're trying to get the patient to have a little bit of respiratory cycling. So you try to give them some oxygen but the likelihood that you shorten their life actually goes up with every percent oxygen increase. The atmospheric oxygen is around 20%. It's not unusual for us to be at 40% on a respirator uh, uh, with artificial gas environments. And the mortality goes skyrocketing after 40%. So if you go up to 60%, 80%, or you know, most toxically 100% of oxygen flow, that person dies very quickly. And that's exactly what we did in COVID. Uh, we put people in ICUs all over the world and gave them high flow oxygen and killed them very quickly. And we reached 88% mortality rates in New York hospitals, putting people on respirators. When what we should have done is help them breathe deep, slow breath and start moving CO2 through those, those inflamed membranes rather than forcing oxygen into the system. And so we, we cause a lot of death in ICUs by by oxygen belief systems. And it's sad that doctors continue to believe that humans breathe oxygen and without oxygen, they die. The story is actually carbon. If, if the CO2 and carbon isn't cycling through the cell, then the, the human dies. Oxygen can play a role in the amount of carbon being used, but it's not the fuel. It's actually the foot on the accelerator pedal. The gas in the tank is carbon. So that same thing is happening in the atmosphere of the planet now because we're losing the surface area of the lungs, which is the soils of the world. We can no longer breathe as a planet. And so the CO2 is in the bloodstream of the planet, which is the air. And, and no matter how much CO2 you pull off of the blood of somebody in the ICU, you don't save them. They're not dying of too much CO2 in their bloodstream. They're dying of too much you know, incapacity to, to move gas uh, back and forth and therefore get vitality. And so this idea of sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere and storing it underground is a ludicrous just complete break of understanding of biologic systems. And it's it's not because these people are idiots, it's because we're basically paying engineers billions of dollars to solve the carbon crisis. Well, those engineers have never studied microbiology by and large. They're not looking at the system as a biologic living organism, they're looking at it as a chemistry problem or a physics problem. And so they're like, well, oh, too much carbon there, we'll just put it down there and then it'll all be right. Well, that's unfortunately what we're doing, you know, with Western medicine across the board is, oh, you know, they've got COVID or they've got emphysema. Let's put them on a respirator and then we kill them. Oh, they've got cancer. Let's poison the system. And then they die at the same rate, no matter what we do, which is one of the, the sad kind of non-told stories in my field of, of chemotherapy and everything else is 
every every clinical trial that we've done since the 1960s on chemotherapy, radiation, surgery combinations, we can change the, the death cause as cancer in a, in a small number of people by doing all these different iterations, but we never change all co- cause mortality. No matter what we do, chemo, chemo with surgery, chemo with surgery, radiation, just radiation, any of these you know sequences of poisoning or cutting up the body, we don't change the all-cause mortality. And now that you understand that cancer is a symptom of a body on decline from phase angle of 10 to 3.5, and radiation surgery have absolutely nothing to do with why you would put them up at a higher phase angle. Well, there's no wonder they're going to die at the same rate because this, the, the process that was accelerating towards death, symptom of cancer comes in right before death. You remove the cancer. Well, they're still going to die same cause, same time as if the cancer had never been there or was there and got treated is irrelevant. They're on this natural decline in light energy per cubic centimeter of the body. So in that same way, no matter how much carbon we pump out of the atmosphere, this planet is going to die and finish its extinction cycle regardless of it. And so all the things that we see, climate crisis, quote unquote, which could be warming of the oceans, you know, violent storms, you know, the, the uh, I mean, there's lots of debate as to what's actually going on with the fire situation, but forest fires we'll, we'll, we'll say could be part of that or whatever it is. So any of these desertification as a concept. So the, every year on the planet right now, an area the size of Poland goes into desert that was previously grassland or forest. And so we're losing you know enormous amount of green back into desert right now because we're in a natural desertification cycle of the planet that's been accelerated by human behavior. And so we need to kind of stop looking symptomatically at climate change and realize that we have a really bright and green future on this planet when we start to put human behavior and human ingenuity, human innovation, and ultimately human society in line with this regreening event. And the planet's already greening. Like we've had a 15% increase of green vegetation since the year 2000 on the planet in general. So yes, desertification in lots of zones, but as a total regreening as well. And the more CO2 in the atmosphere, the more greening we're going to ultimately see. And so the fact that we have you know, 450 you know, ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere right now, still 0.04% of the atmospheric you know, gases, that's enough, though, to really supercharge the next breath that the planet takes. And so when we stop doing chemical farming, let the lungs recover, we will go into this massive respiratory recovery, and we'll have the greenest planet, maybe in the history of the 4 billion year planet, which is really intriguing to me. Like we we could have un, un, inadvertently unleashed the greenest earth on, on planetary history because of fossil fuel extraction and all that. We got all those deep reserves of oil, which is old soil, back up into the atmosphere where plants can breathe it again. And so through all of the you know oil and gas industry that we said it was killing the planet, and certainly has done enormous damage to biodiversity and a lot of our corridors of life and everything else. The backside of that wound is that the CO2 in the atmosphere resulting from all that carbon burning is actually the antidote to our problem. And it's going to be the, the fuel in the tank for this regreening of the planet. And so we've created a nonprofit called Project Biome that's understanding the biologic system as a whole. And we're now attracting uh, anybody's family office or NGOs or other people that want to be part of this, we're creating a connective tissue between 4 million nonprofits that are working currently in social and ecological systems to create a coherent three-tiered simple vision of how, how humans start to bring ourselves in harmony with this regreening of the planet. And I think that with our help, the planet can accelerate its natural recovery. It's going to recover one way or another, like, you know, go extinct. It'll be back to normal in a couple thousand years, no matter what. Well, you look at, yeah, you look at Chernobyl and, you know, that was a a massive disaster. And I saw photographs about five years ago of of a fairground there that had had all been closed off, but it was just covered with plants and wildlife. And it, you know, the planet will survive, whatever. It's just whether mankind can survive. Uh, And that's my next question to you. You know, you're part of so many organizations on the soil. You're one of the most learned men I know on the soil and the microbiome and 
is there a chance that we will not survive this or do you think uh, a few people will survive it do you think another form of life if you go back to the dinosaurs i suppose where i'm coming from is when you go back to the dinosaurs you know before the dinosaurs the the planet was covered in these wonderful kind of fungi that looked like fern trees and the soil um i can't remember how deep the topsoil was but it went on forever didn't it i mean it was just yeah, yeah we had you know, 25 to 30 feet of topsoil globally at the time of the dinosaurs and uh, we're lucky to find 25 centimeters of topsoil on the planet right now. So deep, deep reservoirs of life and nutrient biodiversity, microbial di diversity that existed at that time. And then the extinction of the dinosaurs happened through a death of the topsoil. That was caused by an asteroid or a volcanic event that left this big layer of, of dust um, and ash on top of the soils and choked out the soil system. So we anaerobic lack of carbon oxygen movement on the soils and the planet died and went into a deep extinction event about 90 percent of life on earth disappeared we are now that that existential you know injury to the soil systems much like the asteroid was so we're repeating that pattern i think we're a couple of decades away from completing that and so current you know estimates are that we have about 60 harvests left on the planet before we've so thoroughly killed the, the soils of the earth that we can no longer harvest um, you know, even if that's off by logarithms, even if it's 600 years, it's a blink in time for the 300,000 years that humans have been here or the 4 billion years of, of planetary history. So we've brought ourselves and our soil systems to the brink of extinction for sure. Uh, and you can see human health following that same trend. Our, our fertility and wellness is going to exactly track with soil fertility and, and wellness. That's my summation of my last 15 years. You cannot have human health if your soils are dying. It's impossible. And so with that, we we can track. And, and it turns out that even before I knew the soil data, the medical science literature was saying that we had only 80 years left on the planet due to the rate of infertility and the rate of chronic disease in our children. And so we can plot out human destruction within the next 80 years and soil, not surprisingly, you know, 60, 80 years as well. So, so those two are tied together. So we're definitely on an extinction path right now. Uh, but when you're the existential threat rather than an asteroid that we can't, you know, control for. Or an alien. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have this opportunity to shift directions ultimately. And so it's very exciting to me that um, as the existential threat, we, we can, we can be the, become the solution just as we've been the problem. And uh, we already have all the resources on the plan. We already have all the know-how how to regenerate soils at massive levels, billions of acres. Um, and so from Savory Network that's managed over a billion acres of land in Africa, Australia, and other places have regrown native grasslands through uh, movement of, of keystone species, large toves animals, et cetera, all the way to the regenerative organic you know, movement, which really was before, before regen came a, a buzz phrase. It was biodynamic farming and, uh, and permaculture practices of the last century and now there's new korean farming and all kinds of new ones that have come up in the last couple of decades um, but the fact is we know how to grow food at scale where it's good for the soil you know the more food you grow the more soil there is uh, and and so we know how to do it we just need a, a cohesive you know vision of where we're going and, and how to achieve it so we can get sociopolitical coordination behind this new new human movement and I believe that we can actually become something new. I think every time nature brings itself, you know, brings life to its knees, it always springs back in beautiful ways. The planet always gets more intelligent. Uh, the system always gets more biodiverse and with every single iteration after an extinction. So we are just moments away from the most beautiful earth that's ever been here in 4 billion years. My selfish hope is that, you know, I get to stay and play and my kids and grandkids get to, to play in, the, in those fields of flowers that we can't imagine. So uh, that's that's my deep hope and belief that we can change direction. But my third step, especially, was in the hospice and palliative care, and I never saw a death that looked like an endpoint. It's always a rebirth. It's always a reconnection to source, a reconnection to the, the experience that you're actually everything. Everything is in you. You are the the whole piece as well. And as you let go of the physical body, you merge back into the wholeness of the universe itself. You know, and uh, that first law of thermodynamics, you know, they neither create or destroy energy. I, I already explained to you that you're 10,000 times brighter than a sun, so you can't underestimate the amount of energy that you have you know, been blessed to, to coalesce or self-organize in your mother's womb and then grow into the human you've become. 
you are an energy force uh, that is brighter than suns. And so you are not going to disappear at the end of this you know, bodily lifespan. You're going to re-release that energy uh, into a, a new coordinated expression of life. And, and it's going to do something somewhere in the cosmos. And so that's that's the promise really in the end is there actually is not an end point. And so it sounds like human extinction, extinction is a horrible thing from an anthropocentric human perspective it's the end of end of something but what bursts out of that could be spectacularly intelligent and more beautiful than than what we're capable of doing right now and there's a lot of prophecies from indigenous peoples and the like and even you know extraterrestrial you know channels and all these weird things that are happening in these last few decades that are saying that in this decade that we're in 2017 to 2027 there is going to be this genetic reawakening of humanity and we're going to actually re-express human genomics in a much more complex sacred geometry inside that liquid crystal of the cell and start to go more into a 12 strand of DNA instead of the two strand of DNA that we currently have. And that sounds kind of like, you know, science fiction until you find out that actually just the last couple of years, we just for the first time discovered four strand of DNA in human cells. And so it's a revelation that's starting to fit the, the prophecies of, of these indigenous sources uh, and these kind of cosmic sources of information. And so I'm actually deeply believing that we can make this transformational change as we already have done from two, two strands to four strands. Now it's not much of a jump to, to a 12 stranded thing because basically you'll have a relationship of three braids of, of four or four braids of three, some conformational change there where your, your double helices start to become quadrihelices and then three of those quadrihelices braid together and you end up with a 12 strand of DNA held within the liquid crystal of a human that's figured out how to move their phase angle from 10 to maybe 20 um, to maybe 100. You know, we don't know how how bright we can shine uh, as biology iterates. And so it's quite possible that we can make these logarithmic changes of 10 or 100 fold the amount of light energy held within a human being. And that then informing or playing with a 12 strand of DNA, we will make bodies that do things we can't imagine the strength that we could produce the intelligence we could produce the longevity we could even enjoy all of those things could you know go beyond science fiction at this point as to our full capacity to express life well you talk there about the the ancient people and you know the tribal people of the world and i know you've had a lot of interaction with them um i saw you at medicine festival this year i still got my band on uh and it, i think it's a very we're, we're going to be looking at the native people of the world to take us forward they have the the knowledge and the information that we've just lost as we've become disconnected from our soil, our land, our environment. And I'm sure that 8 billion people are on this planet at this moment in time because there's one hell of a gig just about to go down. And I, for one, am very excited about it too. There are... I'm, you know, I'm doing a, a hoogal culture bed in my garden at the moment because I learned about Aborig Aboriginal hoogal culture. And, but I'm mean, quite old, but there are lots of young people out there that I'm seeing that are kind of going, I'm not going in the system. I'm going to get my van and I'm going to travel. I'm going to get back to nature and get back to the soil. And people really seem to want to do this now, don't they? Yeah, you can feel the energy everywhere. Every continent I go to now, there's a social rising. There's a, a rise in our our awareness of the universe itself, not just the soil, but our connection to the cosmos, our connection to uh, intelligences from around the, around that cosmos. And so we are about to be introduced to all the other beings that have been here since before humankind. Um, I think you know, really working with and and biologically, you know, programming this planet to to support life. And, uh, you know, uniquely humans are about to go do that same thing. And uh, next decade, we'll be on Mars trying to grow soil in Mars. And we'll be doing all kinds of you know experiments on genetic modification on Mars to, to get life going there. And so you can imagine if there's, you know, intelligent species that, you know, predate us by a couple hundred thousand years or a couple million years, there's no doubt that they've had the ability to, you know, if, if we can do it in our nascent state of science and intelligence, uh, I believe there's many species that have been moving through the cosmos, seeding life, just as we will on Mars. Um, and so it's interesting to imagine ourselves as a really beautiful expression of nature, scientifically driven out of the ingenuity of, of the intelligence of the cosmos expressed through beings. 
And uh, ultimately, I think we're about to be introduced to them. U.S. Senate you know, talking every day now with all these hearings going on about the fact that we've had about a 100 year program working directly with UFOs, UAPs and extraterrestrial uh, or, or non-human species. And so that that's a pretty intriguing thing to be on CNN <laughs> and the <be, laughs> Senate chatting about. And it's the, the only bizarre thing to me is that we haven't changed our behavior, behavior as humans and hearing that on CNN, you would think that people would be like, wait, what? Oh, well, then we need to chuck all of our you know, belief systems about religion that's causing us to you know go into conflicts and wars over our belief systems about whether we're Islamic or Hebrew or, or Jewish or whatever the heck you're claiming. Um, we're one species and we're all indigenous to this planet. Ultimately, we are all strung together of the genomic possibility on this earth. We are the genetic imagination of life before us. We are the genetic imagination of the dinosaurs and all the other species that lived before that last extinction. And they secreted our genetic potential into the atmosphere through the viral discharge that happens naturally when an organism is under stress. And so already we're churning out genetic sequences for the future human humans, the future of, of life, multicellular life on earth. We're already participating in that creative possibility. We are at the cellular level already imagining the next beauty and species that will populate the earth. And I'm intrigued to find out if that's just an update to our own genome or actually the death of ours and, and the birth of something completely new. Uh, it'll be beautiful regardless, I'm sure. What a wonderful way to end the podcast. But before we go, can you just tell our audience where they can find you? Because I know that you're doing some wonderful work. I want to bring Ion up uh, and you know, all the wonderful things that you're doing at the moment. Zach, tell us where we can find you and what you've got. First of all, tell us about Ion because I want people to know exactly what it is. Yeah, so uh, intelligenceofnature.com. You'll find all the science there and the products, but we are extracting from fossil soils before the dinosaur extinction. We're extracting the, the microbial metabolites, the, the carbon molecules that create the cell signaling between human cells. And a cell that has unfettered access to information repairs at an extreme rate. And so we're finding that we can induce a, a cellular vitality and regenerative capacity within human cells when we show those human cells something they've never seen in their history. We've only been here 300,000 years, 55 million years ago, this soil existed. And so every bottle that goes into an, a hand of a human gives me goosebumps because that human is about to dial up their biology to a level never possible in human history. And so we're taking that, that deep, deep data source of information and, and capacity of, of moving information from cell to cell. And it happens to also be the nutrient delivery system. We can get a thousand fold increase in the amount of nutrient that actually gets into your bloodstream from your gut when those nutrients are held within these carbon baskets that, that are delivered in this product. So um, that's that's looking at kind of the full potential of, of this sunlight into star energy within you is, is transiting through these carbon molecules uh, of the fossil soil system. So that's intelligenceofnature.com for a bunch of other you know science lectures and education around everything from viruses to breath work to beyond. You can tap into uh, zachbushmd.com for a bunch of free content. If you get inspired and you want to go through, a, you know, really a, a, a revolution of health on your own, our journey of intrinsic health.com is a eight week program that you can do. Um, our favorite is our, our group program now, uh, but we also have one on one coaching. So we have either group coaching with about eight individuals going through the eight week process together with a coach or one on one coaching through the journey. Um, and this has become a massive area of transformation. I, I can't even begin to tell you the testimonies that are flowing out on a daily basis from the, the thousands of people that have gone through the program. So if you want to dial into that journey of intrinsic health.com and take a look there, we have an online community that comes out of that experience. We have a, an app that is a community connection app that um, we have groups all over the world that are now connecting in person, creating business accelerators, creating companies. You know, people are doing all kinds of cool things together once they kind of go through this transformational reconnection to their relationship with food, their relationship with breath, their relationship with hydration, their relationship with movement and exercise, relationship to community, relationship to play, the relationship to sexuality, all of this stuff being programmed, you know, uh, into that eight weeks allows for this release of our previous belief systems that kind of kept us pinned down biologically in this fear guilt shame kind of construct and how we release that into this new opportunity has been a real you know 
amazing journey for myself. I've, it's been a 15 year project really in a lot of ways. And I was able to close my clinic last year because we're doing better work and more potent healing processes through this eight week program than we, than I ever achieved one-on-one -on -one with my patients in clinic. So it's been that humbling ride as a medical doctor to realize not only was the science not true about, you know, pharmaceutical dependence for, for biologic wellness, it's also not true that doctors are your source of health, ultimately community connection and having a mirror of somebody on the other side of you to show you how beautiful you are is really the secret to, to deep healing and that deep correction of that fear, guilt, shame paradigm that you're carrying around inside of you right now. So I encourage you to be released from that if you want to, journeyofintrinsichealth.com. And then diving into our nonprofits would love your support and interactions with us. Farmersfootprint.org.uk uh, yeah. is uh, mm. our group there in the UK. And they're amazing. And so if you're you now uh, Jess Abbas at the at the helm there with a the whole wonderful team around her, um, she's energizing the EU and UK into a, a whole new stratosphere of uh, to become a uh, epigenetic uh, epigenetic kind of transfer of information and, and joy. Um, so engage there, farmersfootprint.org.uk. If you're in Australia, it's uh, the same URL, but .aus. Um, and then uh, farmersfootprint.nz is our New Zealand arm that just launched. Uh, so plug in there. In the United States, it's farmersfootprint.us. Uh, you can uh, go there for the big vision of how the whole planet goes into one biologic process. Uh, follow along at projectbiome.org. And so those are a bunch of URLs that you get, get you plugged in one way or another. <laughs> we will put all of those in the show notes. But I just want to say, I'm feeling, we, we started on a bit of a low note. I was feeling a little bit kind of like, oh, what the fuck? Uh, how are we going to sort this out? Uh, and I feel so enlightened now. I'm absolutely buzzing. And Zach Bush, MD, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart, not just for coming on the show, but for everything that you do for mankind. Bless you, my lovely. Yeah, so good to be with you, Philly. You guys all have a wonderful day, evening, night, whatever you're in the midst of there. And uh, may, you, may you shine brighter tomorrow. Amen.